the Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This is Your FBI. This is Your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. If your plans include sending your youngster to college or providing for a pleasant, comfortable life after 60, owning your own home free and clear years ahead of time, we have a plan. By we, I mean the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and its 8,000 representatives from coast to coast. It will pay you to get acquainted with your local equitable representative. He's friendly, helpful, and he knows the answers. In about 13 minutes, I'd like to tell you more about him and how he may help you to enjoy the many advantages of membership in the Equitable Society. Tonight, the subject of our FBI file, Homicide. Its title, The Death Cruise. It is the proud record of your FBI that 97% of those the Bureau apprehends and takes to court are later found guilty and sentenced. That record indicates a thoroughness and a basic respect for detail in every investigation. Because it often happens that the only testimony for the prosecution is given by special agents of your FBI. After conviction, the file on that case is marked closed. Those files are records of jobs well done records of which the Bureau is justifiably proud. For that reason, it is understandable that your FBI does not like to reopen a file that has been marked closed, does not like to have to do its job all over again. That does not happen very often, but as you will see in tonight's case, it does happen. Tonight's FBI file opens on the mouth of a river located in one of our eastern seaboard states. A cabin cruiser courses slowly down this stream. Rounding a bend, it noses into a weather-worn dock. Its pilot, a young man in his middle twenties, ties the boat to a stanchion and walks down the dock to a dilapidated waterfront hotel. He opens a sun-warped screen door and enters the lobby. Hello? Anyone here? Just a minute. Well? Hello. What do you want? Are you in charge here? Yes, why? I'm uh, looking for information. What about? One of the boats that's tied to the dock out there. Which one? Seamaid Second. Who owns it, you know? No. Yeah, isn't that uh, dock connected with your hotel? No, everybody uses it. Oh. Well, look, mister, if you just came here to ask questions, I haven't got the time. No, I... wait, please. Well, what is it? The uh, sea maid passed me an hour or so ago upstream. I thought I recognized its pilot. Did, did you see the boat tie up? No, I didn't. Well, uh, perhaps you know this man. He's about my size, blonde hair, mustache. His name is Sanderson. I never heard of him. But if he uses this dock, you... Well, I told you anybody can use it. Well, he, he couldn't have docked more than 10 or 15 minutes ago. Where could he have gone from here, do you know? Oh, to town, maybe. What town? Fairport, Clear Falls, Cedar Point. They're all near here. I see. Well, I guess I'll just have to wait for him. Sometimes people leave their boats here for days. I'll wait. Who's there? Alice. Well, what is it? What do you want? Well, I've got to see you. All right, come in. I told you, Alice, that I wanted to take a nap. I know. Well, why do you disturb me? Well, a man was here looking for you. 
Who was he? I don't know. What did he want? He didn't say. Did he ask for me by name? Yes. He said you passed him in your boat upstream. He thought he recognized you and followed you down here. Where is he now? He left. He returned to his boat. What did you tell him? That I didn't know who you were or where you'd gone. I see. But he's going to wait for you anyway. This is bad. Well, I tried my best to get rid of him, John. Raise the window shade. Sure. And just a trifle. How's that? Fine. Now, which one is his boat? Well, it's at the very end of the dock there, you see? Yes. He must be below. Where's your husband? He went into town. As soon as he returns, send him up here. Hello, aboard there. Yes? Someone hailing me? Yep. What do you want? Are you the owner of this boat? Yeah. Let's see your license. Boat license? Nope. License for using this dock. Uh Oh. Oh, I didn't know one was necessary. It's a town ordinance. Who are you? Deputy sheriff. I see. Well, look, could I arrange to get a license from you? Nope. Got to get one in town. Are they open this time of night? Nope. Well, what do I do? Leave the dock. I couldn't do that. Look, mister, that's an order. Sheriff, I... I might as well tell you why I'm here. All I'm interested in is a license. Listen, that uh, boat right over there, the sea made second, I followed down the river this afternoon. There was a man aboard it I think I recognized. Huh? I know that government agents would be very anxious to apprehend him if he's the man I think he is. Are you a government agent? No. Any kind of policeman? No. And why are you so interested? I was in Army intelligence during the war. Buddy, the war is all over. Yes, but... Look, I... which boat are you talking about? That one down there, with the black hull. Her name ain't Seamaid Second. Yes, it is. That's the Ebony Queen. Oh, I'm sorry you're wrong. Come on, have a look for yourself. All right, well... I'll prove to you that's the Ebony Queen, owned by a man named Smith who lives at Cedar Point. He ain't been in no trouble with the government ever. This Smith about my size? Blonde hair, mustache? No, sir. He's short, fat, and bald. Well, would anyone else be using his boat? Nope. Well, what does that say there? <laughs> Ebony Queen. Yep. I don't understand. That's the boat I followed. Look, mister, your story just don't make no sense. You go on back to your boat, cast off your lines, and pull out of here. Oh, sorry, Sheriff. I'm staying. Some 50 miles away in an FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor is just approaching the desk of the agent in charge. Mr. McComb? Yes, Jim. Could I see you for a minute, sir? Well, surely. What's on your mind? I received a phone call late this afternoon from a friend of mine named Ed Bartlett. Yeah? Ed was in Army intelligence during the war. We worked together on a number of cases involving enemy aliens. Mm. That was when I was with the uh, New York office. I see. One of the men we picked up at the beginning of the war was a Nazi named John Sanderson. He'd been engaged in subversive activity. He was convicted on several counts and sent to a federal prison. I remember hearing about him. Well, you may also recall, sir, that Sanderson was released at the end of the war and deported to Germany. Yes, yes, I do. But uh, what's this got to do with your friend's phone call? Well, Ed's been out on his boat on a fishing trip for the past week. This afternoon, a small pleasure cruiser passed him. Ed was almost certain the man at the wheel was John Sanderson. What? Yeah, he said he followed the boat to a dock down near Cedar Point. No one was a boarder, so he inquired at a nearby hotel as to where the man had gone. He couldn't learn anything there. Well, Jim, uh, this sounds more like a case of mistaken identity. Well, I thought so myself at first, sir, but Ed insisted he had the right man. Knowing him, I'm inclined to believe him. Well, we have a file on Sanderson here. Check it. It's possible we're both mistaken. Maybe he wasn't a boarder. Well, sir, I've already checked. He was sent out of the country over five years ago. Mm, I see. Where's your friend now? He's standing by down there, waiting for the man to return. Has he contacted the local police? Well, I advised him to. I'm not so sure that he will. Uh, Mr. McComb. Yeah? I wonder if you'd give me permission to go down there. If this is a false lead, I'll be back by tomorrow night. Go ahead, Jim. (laughs) 
Yes? It's me, Henry. Come in. Now, what happened? Well, weren't you watching from the window? It was too dark to see, but I didn't hear his boat pull away. He ain't going. Why not? He just said he was going to wait until you came back. Did you impersonate a deputy sheriff? Yep. Well, didn't you threaten to arrest him? Yep. He just said, go ahead. Well, what about the boat? Did you repaint the name? Mm-hmm. But he's still going to stay. What did you find out about him? He said he was in Army intelligence during the war. Oh. Also said the government agents would be very happy to grab you. He's really going to be difficult to get rid of. Yeah. Where's Alice? Downstairs. Bring her up here. Can you see all right, mister? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just lead the way. When did this man come to your hotel? About 20 minutes ago. He took a room for the night. His name is Sanderson, huh? That's right. And he's got blonde hair and a mustache, just like the fellow that you were looking for. Mm-hmm. That's why I came right down to your boat to get you. Oh, I appreciate it. Oh, here's the back door. You can go in this way. Right. Now, his room is right at the head of these stairs. Thanks. Oh, wait. Um, yeah? Well, I just happened to think, um, now, there ain't going to be any trouble between you two, is there? Well, to tell you the truth, there might be. Oh, well, then I'd better get the sheriff. He's right out front in the lobby. Yeah, that might not be a bad idea. Bring him up to the room. Okay. Come in. Yes? Hello, Mr. Sanderson. Hello. Do you remember me? Yes, of course. You're the young man who was in Army Intelligence. That's right. What brings you here? Your boat passed mine on the river today. I recognized you. So? You were deported from this country about five years ago, weren't you, Sanderson? That's right. Then how did you get back here? Illegally. Well, you admit that, huh? Yes. I'm going to have to see to it that you're deported again. Really? How? By turning you over to the FBI. Have you the authority to make an arrest? No. Then how are you going to do it? Well, this should be your answer. Come in. Here's the sheriff. Good. Come in, sheriff. Okay. You uh, wanted to see me? Yes, sheriff. This is the man I was looking for. Well? He's in this country illegally. He should be arrested and turned over to the FBI. Did you hear that, Sheriff? Yep. Well, what are you going to do about it? Well, now, let me see. You should obey the man, you know. You think so? Of course. What is this? Show him, Henry. Okay. <laughs> nice work, Sheriff. We will return in just a moment to tonight's exciting case from the official files of your FBI. But right now, here's a question. When was the last time you saw your doctor for a complete physical checkup? Everybody should see his doctor regularly. Keeping healthy is protection for your family, just as the right kind of life insurance is protection for your loved ones no matter what happens in the future. What is the right kind of protection? Perhaps the experience of Mr. Frank Murphy may help you. Mr. Murphy... Before you became a member of the Equitable Life Assurance Society, what was your problem? Protection for my wife and kids. You see, I make a comfortable living, but not big money. My social security would help, but it certainly isn't enough to keep my family well-fed, well-housed, and well-clothed until my youngest gets through high school. So when I heard you talk about a plan that would provide me with that kind of security, I got interested. That's our Equitable Family Security Plan. Right, and a good name for it, too. So as you suggested, I called my local equitable representative and he came right over. He didn't try to sell me anything. First he gave me a chart and made it simple and easy for me to figure how much more income my wife would need to keep her and the kids in comfort. And that's the famous equitable fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Incidentally, there's no charge for this chart. 
It's available to everyone who wants to know exactly how much protection his family needs. The chart was a big help, and our equitable man was a bigger help. Now that my family's secure, I'd advise anybody to call up his equitable man. They're good men to do business with. They are. You see, equitable men are more than life insurance men. They're interested in your problems and in presenting a plan that fits your needs and your budget. So please remember, no matter what your insurance problem may be, talk it over with your local Equitable Society representative. Ask him for your free copy of the fact-finding chart for fathers and mothers. Consult your local telephone directory for the name of this friendly, helpful neighbor, your local representative of the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to tonight's FBI file, The Death Cruise. The desire to see that justice is done is strong in almost every one of us. But sometimes that desire leads to trying to take the law into your own hands. As tonight's case from the files of your FBI illustrates, that is the wrong course of action. In every city, there is a local police force. In every state, there are state troopers. And in every section of the country, there are field offices of your FBI. It is their job to see that laws are enforced, that justice is dealt out fairly, your job as a citizen is to respect and obey those laws. And when, as will sometimes happen, you know of a crime that has been committed or a criminal who has gone unpunished, do not assume the responsibility of seeing justice done. Your responsibility ends when you have done your duty, when you have notified your local police. Tonight's file continues at the police station in the town of Cedar Point. Special Agent Jim Taylor has just introduced himself to the Chief of Police. Sit down, Mr. Taylor. Thanks. Now, what can I do for you? Did a man named Ed Bartlett contact you any time yesterday or this morning? Bartlett? Mm. No, he didn't. Why? Well, he called me yesterday afternoon. He'd been out on his boat on the river. He thought he recognized a man who had been deported from this country some five years ago. Where was this? On the river. This man was in another boat, and he uh, trailed him to a dock about two miles north of here. The one near the Ocean View Hotel? Yeah, that's right. I told him to contact the police. I, well, I thought he might have come to you. He didn't. Have you tried the Fairport police? Yes, sir, I have. How about Clearfault? No, they hadn't heard from him either. Have you looked for him? Yeah, I went down to the dock. I couldn't find any trace of his boat, though. Maybe the man took off again and Bartlett followed him. Yeah, that's very possible. Did he give you a description of the other boat, the one the suspect was on? No, no, he didn't. Well, I'm afraid... Excuse me. Sure. Chief Jenkins. Yes? Yeah. What's that? Where was this? I see. What's the name of the boat? All right. Thanks a lot. I'll be right down there. Mr. Taylor, what does Bartlett look like? He's about six feet tall, dark hair. Was the name of his boat the Lucky Star? It sounds like it, yeah. I'm afraid I have some bad news for you. What is it? The body of a man of that general description was just found in a boat named the Lucky Star. Oh, no. We can't be sure that it's Bartlett, of course. Where was this? About ten miles downstream. It drifted into shore. Well, let's get down there at once. That you, Henry? We're here in the back room. Did you go into the village? Yep. Any news of the boat? Nope. It'll probably be found sometime this afternoon. That soon? I imagine so. But what do we do? I'll leave tonight, just as I planned. But suppose the police should come here. Why should they? When they find his body, they could also learn that he had docked here. My dear sister, we took great pains to make it appear that his death was accidental. Well, yes, Look, but... Look, Alice, stop worrying. Everything is going to be okay. Hello, 
There's the body right over there, Mr. Taylor. Yeah, I see. Well. Yeah, it's in Portland, right? Too bad. I guess we'll have to examine him. Look at the back of his head. Yeah, I see. Say, there's blood on the back of that boat hook there. From the position of the body, he could have very easily slipped and fallen against it. Yeah, he could have, but I don't think he did. I'd say this is very carefully staged to appear that way. You think he caught up with the man he was looking for? Uh huh. If he'd only contacted you, Chief, instead of trying to do the job alone. Yeah. Well, shall we go below? Oh, wait, I want to search his pockets first. It's just barely possible he might have left a note of some kind. Telling you more about this man he was following? Mm -hmm. If we just had a description of his boat. Yeah, I know. Find anything? Oh, just this book of matches might be of some help to us, though. How's that? Well, they're from the Ocean View Hotel. That's the place by the dock, isn't it? Yeah. Well, then you must have gone in there at some time. You, uh, you know the people who run it? Yes, yeah, a couple named Fowler. Well, they might be able to give us some information. Well, we can... Hold it. What is it? Some blue paint here on the deck. See it? Yeah. It's a very odd shade of blue. It didn't spill here. Looks like it rubbed off or something. Uh-huh. I'm going to scrape a few flecks of it off. You want a knife? No, I, I've got one, thanks. Oh, Chief, why don't you go ashore and notify the coroner? I'll finish up here. Go ahead, Miss Taylor. Thanks. Who's that? Chief of Police Jenkins, Mrs. Fowler. Oh. Hello, Mr. Jenkins. Hello. This is Mr. Taylor, Mrs. Fowler. How do you Hello, do? Mrs. Fowler. Mr. Taylor is a special agent of the FBI. I see. Well, you might be able to help him. How? Well, yesterday afternoon, a man named Ed Bartlett put his boat into that dock outside there. Ed Bartlett? That's right. He's a man about six feet tall, dark hair, slightly broken nose. You see him by any chance? No, sir. We have reason to believe he came here to your hotel. Well, I didn't see anybody that looked like him. Did you see his boat? It was called the Lucky Star. No, sir. Oh, here's Mr. Fowler. He might be able to help us. Mr. Fowler? No. Oh. Hello, Chief. Hello. This is Mr. Taylor. He's from the FBI. Hello, Hiya. Man. We're looking for information, Mr. Fowler, about a man named uh, Ed Bartlett who docked his boat outside here yesterday afternoon. It's called the Lucky Star. Did you see it? No, didn't. Maybe you saw him. He was six feet tall, dark hair, slightly broken nose. Nope. Didn't see him. Uh, our Chief, I'm afraid this is a bad lead. We'd better be going. But, uh, Thanks a lot you... anyway, folks. Uh, come on, Chief. Okay. Henry? Hmm? Get upstairs and tell John who was here. Let's head out here to the end of the dock, Chief. Okay. Say, don't you think we should have questioned the Fowlers a little more? I purposely cut that interview short. Why? You notice Fowler's trousers? No, I didn't. Well, there was a streak of blue paint on the right leg. I'm certain it was the same color paint that I scraped off the deck of Bartlett's boat. Well. It reminded me of where I'd seen that paint before. I noticed a can of it yesterday when I came out here onto the dock. Where about? Well, it's right alongside this boat up here. I'm shining your flashlight around, will you, Chief? Sure. Hey, there's a paint can. Yeah, I think that's the one. Hey, it's that same odd shade of blue. Yeah. Now, I wonder if you... Wait a minute. Shine your light again on the stern of the boat there. Right there? Yeah. Hold it. Look, Chief, the name on that boat's been freshly painted. Ebony Queen. Uh -huh. Suppose it was called something else before? The name was changed to avoid suspicion? Could have been. Well, if it was, then that's Sanderson's boat. This whole paint cycle ties together... You think Fowler's mixed up in it, too? Yeah. Look, will you go aboard and search the boat? Okay. I'm heading for the nearest phone to call my office. I want to see if anyone named Fowler has ever been mixed up with Sanderson. Uh, 
Is that you, Mr. Taylor? Kindly put up your hands. Huh? What are you doing on this boat? I'm Chief of Police Jenkins. You haven't answered my question. Who are you? That doesn't matter. Would your name be Sanderson? Yes. Then you know why I'm here. Yes, but it isn't going to do you any good. What do you mean? I'm about to take a trip down the river. I need a change. You won't get very far. I will if I travel alone. Is that you, Henry? Yeah. Come below. We have company. You undoubtedly know the chief of police. Yep. He was nosing around down here. We're going to have to take care of him. Mm-hmm. Go above and cast off the line first. I would prefer that this happen while we're out in the river. Well, do as I say. I can't. Why not? Because I've got a gun in his back. Drop yours, Sanderson. <coughs> I pick up his gun, chief. Okay. Thanks. My office told me that Fowler was Sanderson's brother-in-law. I dropped by, picked him up, and brought him down here. Sure glad you did. Now I can place them both under arrest. It was proved that although Ed Bartlett was assaulted in the hotel, his death occurred on the boat. Therefore, Sanderson was convicted in federal court for murder on the high seas and sentenced to be executed. Henry and Alice Fowler were convicted as accomplices and given a life prison term in a federal penitentiary. This time, your FBI marked its file not closed, but dead. And it was able to do that only because of the shrewd powers of observation of a special agent who remembered where he had seen an off shade of Pate. Those powers of observation are not a talent that anyone is born with, but they are a talent that can be developed, that has been developed, that has been developed in the course of study that every special agent must pass before he becomes a qualified member of your FBI, before he goes to work for you, the American people. One primary cause of much needless worry is money. Husbands worry about the future security of their wives and children. Others worry about poverty and old age. Others worry about assuring their children's education. Now, there is one man who can help you enjoy freedom from such worries. He is your local equitable representative, the friendly, helpful neighbor who knows the answers to your problem. Consult your local telephone directory for the name of your local representative of the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Its subject, Homicide. Its title, The Astrological Breakout. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious, and any similarity thereof to the names of places or persons, living or dead, is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Herb Butterfield, Lamont Johnson, Bill Johnstone, Mary Ann Cape, Lou Merrill, and Vernon Rich. This is Your FBI is a Jerry Devine production. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the astrological breakout on This is Your FBI.